Uh, Laura McAllister is Professor of Governance at the University of Liverpool School of Management and an expert on devolution. She was a member of the Richard Commission, of course. Um, she's currently a member of the uh, National Assembly Remuneration Board. Uh, she's also a former Wales football international and national team captain with 24 caps and chair of Sport Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, Laura McAllister. Well, Diolch and Felicity, thank you for that very warm welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to contribute to this extremely important event and I have to say I'm delighted to hand over my usual slot as the awkward woman to Keris. Um, and, and didn't she fulfil the role wonderfully this morning? Um, my, my plan is to talk a little bit about diverse approaches to leadership. Um, now, that's inherently... Sorry, let me go back a bit. That's inherently risky for a whole host of reasons. Um, there's always a danger, of course, of getting it horribly wrong when you're talking to a leadership cadre such as yourselves. We practising leaders tread a fairly narrow path between appearing arrogant and overbearing know-alls, as if any of us have discovered all of the skills and tricks of the trade of leadership, or being so equivocal and trepidatious about what we actually say to you, our peers after all, that it renders any of our comments and advice as meaningless and bland. So I'm going to try not to be either of those two things this afternoon. I do find myself these days thinking a lot about what good leadership actually looks like. And I'm afraid that whatever mystique some impose, or however much different sectors protest that theirs is somehow different, for me it all comes down to some pretty basic human values which I plan to share with you. My first observation is that we all, but particularly women in positions of influence and power, not least because there are notab notably fewer of us, and incidentally, despite some grand statements in Welsh public life, it's pretty shameful that there are not more women now in positions of authority than there were when I first took my public appointment a decade ago. We all need to become less self-conscious and more confident about talking about what it means to be a leader in the Welsh public service. Because every one of us in this room is a leader, but there are plenty beyond. And they don't all look and sound like us, nor are they all in senior positions or at the top of traditional hierarchies. My second point is that there's no singular profile of a good leader. The fact that we're all wired differently should be respected and, in my view, celebrated. Any, sh any leadership training or personal development schemes that you attend that encourage conformity or copying or present a single prototype leadership style should be discredited or, even better, in my opinion, binned. Because the best leadership is in teams, and teams should be all diverse and different, hence my title. So here's the nub. Wales would no more have qualified for Euro 2016 with a team of Gareth Bales than if we'd put out our Sport Wales Works five-a-side team against Be Belgium and Bosnia. I mean that very sincerely. Because if we're serious about striving to develop a fit-for-purpose leadership cadre in Wales, as we've heard very eloquently over the past two days, then shoehorning us all into a rigid sealed box labelled public leaders in Wales is the last thing we need for improvement, renewal or diversity, but most of all for change and success. Now I confess to being hugely cynical about the so-called experts who advise on leadership. You all know the types. Those who prance around on platforms, charging exorbitant fees usually, calling themselves leadership experts, gurus, doctors, what have you. Traditionally, these have been men, but I'm pretty horrified to find there are now women plying their trade in this shady area as well. <laughs> they use concepts and terminology pinched from those leadership textbooks that dominate the shelves of railway stations WH Smiths the cheery motivational self-help ones that tell us things like, in a hyperkinetic world, inward-looking and self-obsessed leaders are a liability. Never. Okay. <laughs> or, or urge us to do some diagnostic exercises for the modern leader to discover her weaknesses and self-doubts. Well, we're exposed to our weaknesses and self-doubts every day as leaders. Our last thing we want is more diagnostic exercises. That is not leadership sharing or mentoring with a common purpose, as the admirable and much needed mission for this summit stated. No, that what that is, is mostly fanciful, self-indulgent leadership conceit. 
And if that sounds too scathing, maybe you haven't heard as many of these bogus practitioners, and in some cases, half-baked academics. This is speaking from somebody who works in a business school uh, that I've heard. Because most of these people have never faced a real leadership dilemma. And you all know what real leadership dilemmas are. The messy, contradictory, unglamorous, agonizingly stressful, sleepless decisions that only you can make as a leader. And by the way, which will be criticized from every side when you make them, whatever decision you take. And that's why there's no such thing as the right decision in leadership, only the one that is closest to being right at that moment. Now, I'm going to use quite a few sporting analogies in my contribution, as you'd expect. Why? Well, not just because it's something that I feel very strongly about, but also because sport merges public, private and voluntary. It covers children and adults. It covers community all the way to high performance and elite. It touches health, it touches education, the economy, and at the very heart of it, our identity as a nation. For me, it also demonstrates wonderfully the important truth that perfection doesn't in reality exist in leadership or anywhere else. You'll all have heard of Nadia Comaneci, the Romanian gymnast. She was the first gymnast to ever gain a first to ever gain a perfect 10 and three gold medals in the running in the Montreal Olympics in 1976. But interestingly, Comaneci, taking that athlete's mentality, acknowledged that success not as perfection, despite the fact she couldn't have got a higher score. She recalled that she soaked up the applause, but then went straight back to training that evening to get even better. So, so much for perfection, even when it's awarded in a mechanical and empirical way. Learning and improving, not perfection, should be at the heart of good organizations and good leaders. Personally, I want to learn from other leaders at all levels and in every sector, but I have become selective. I want to learn from a specific type of leader, those who are first and most importantly sufficiently self-aware to be cognizant of their frailties as well as their strengths. Those who've analysed their own professional and personal journeys to be able to be properly honest and acknowledge the pitfalls, mistakes and disappointments along the way. It seems to me that for some leaders, at least, the positivity of success is so alluring as to obscure or miss altogether some much more meaningful lessons in leadership, which in my personal case, at least, emerge more powerfully from failures and mistakes. I could tell you intricate details of my errors as a leader and my wrong decisions, whilst things that have gone well for me have faded bar the nice memory of success. And I don't need to tell you as leaders that mistakes proliferate in rough approximation to the number, scale and importance of the decisions that need to be made. The move on mantra, i.e. don't dwell on the mistakes, is only valuable if we actually learn from those mistakes. And regrettably, we still see too much bravado and conceit among some leaders, and an, an unwillingness to see our own part in an organisational underperformance, and a failure to assess how we might avoid making it the mistake again. Blame, by the way, beyond identifying future learning opportunities, is largely a wasted emotion in leadership. Now, all of that set me up quite nicely for you to knock down what I'm about to say, but that's always the risk, and risks, as we said throughout this summit, are all part of what constitutes good public leadership. So here goes. In my view, the greatest foundations which generate better leadership are, first of all, learning, and that's a really critical foundation, as I said a moment ago. Secondly, surrounding yourself as a leader with people who are quirky, creative, and different and those who think differently to yourself, but with whom you have a personal buy-in and empathy. And then thirdly, properly embracing a culture of criticism, scrutiny and challenge. Now these three things are related, of course, and you'll know by what I've said very publicly that I feel strongly about the culture of challenge and scrutiny. If we as public leaders are serious about becoming or making Wales become a proper learning country, populated by citizens with an active appetite to be self-critical and to criticise others, then we must work harder to develop a culture of challenge and reflection. 
one where it's easy and acceptable to have a go at each other, one where we can stretch our ambitions by constructive critiques, because these largely are designed to assist and to improve, not to belittle. And of course, to be receptive to learning and improvement, all of us first need to do a personal, psychological, mental MOT. Receiving feedback of a critical but constructive kind is never easy, and at first it can be downright uncomfortable. But we need to learn to stand back and detach ourselves from ego, from status, and from context. Again, in my experience in sport helps here, because captain of an international team or not, if you drifted off and conceded that penalty in the last minute of a match, the buck stops with you. And believe me, your teammates will let you know with no holds barred and no language spared. Listening is oft quoted as a critical leadership skill, but you know, that doesn't mean just keeping your ears open and nodding in the right places. It means taking away the comments that you hear, thinking, digesting, responding, and acting upon them when appropriate. Learning has to be action-oriented. Too many leaders see challenge, particularly, may I say, from below, or dare I say, even from women and younger people, as an affront, a sign of disconnect or a lack of togetherness. You're either with us or you're against us. And that, quite frankly, is ridiculous and anachronistic. And that leads me to another, I hope, well-meant criticism of us all, and I include myself in this, uh, in, in Welsh public life. No one could accuse us of being short of ambition. Our own Sport Wales goal of every child hooked on sport for life is deliberately eye-watering in its aspiration unashamedly ambitious, as we call it. Nothing wrong with that. But it's of no use on its own without a strategy, tactics, an implementation plan and a timetable. Now, I'm proud to say that we've made massive strides towards that aspiration. Some of you will have heard that last month's school sports survey, the biggest in Europe, by the way, 116,000 young people's voices collected, revealed a further growth in young people's sports participation, nearly a 50% increase since 2011. Other organisations, including our government, have equally admirable and challenging visions, eradicating child poverty by 2020, er, er, making Wales a beacon of sustainable development. No one would question the good intentions of these ambitions. But as leaders, I would humbly suggest that we need to rebalance our strategic focus to put more emphasis on the mechanics of delivery and implementation. That is, elevating the how-to part. How do we plan the stages towards achieving this goal? Matthew Taylor put it very succinctly yesterday, we will the end, not the means. I couldn't agree more. I believe we need to be less allured by the sexy part, the vision and the mission, and start to love the sleeves rolled up part, getting it done, clarity of objectives, strategy and tactics. Now, most sports people hate losing. There's a concept of motivation that distinguishes between the head towards and the move away from drivers. Both of them are equally powerful in stimulating athletes on their way to the podium. Personally, I share that move away from motivation. I hate losing. I share what Wasim Akram, Pakistani fast bowler said, as a type of character who needs to win, not just simply wants to win. And maybe we should all try and feel a bit more of that sporting emotion to be fueled by a hatred of losing or failure. And that's not fear of losing, by the way. It's a hatred of experiencing what it feels like when you lose. And if we are, then we'll be more personally ambitious and we'll believe our own, ambitious mirror, our, our own ambition mirrors that of the people for whom we're trying to serve. So good leadership, in my view, distills down to some pretty basic personal attributes in the first instance. These personal values, ethics and behaviours are a schema for life. They also should also be at the very heart of what we do professionally, because we ignore this side of leadership at our peril. Establishing shared values and behaviours in our organisation should be the foundation for all leadership development, well before we even start to think about functional skills and techniques. Because I believe these bubbles on your screen now are the fundamental toolkits for the good leader. I'm also fully aware that people will interpret these in a variety of ways. One person's courage and belief is another person's misogynist bullying. But good leadership should control that and manage it. 
I think if we start to divest ourselves of some of the traditional images that we all hold of what constitutes a leader, and in doing so, manage a kind of mental cull of those people who, despite their own good press, were actually limited and exclusionary as leaders, then we'll get closer to a diverse picture of what constitutes good leadership. Now, looking at those bubbles, I could talk about any of those, but let me just refer to two of them, which are very important to me personally. Authenticity and aspiration. Authenticity first. Leadership cannot simply be innate, as some claim, unless you believe that there's a single profile to copy for a successful leader. In my view, everyone has the potential to be a good leader, and sometimes the best leaders are those who hide their light under the darkest bushel. Interestingly, I've observed those who call themselves authentic are often in reality the least authentic in their leadership styles. And that's partly because we don't have a culture, certainly in, in Britain, of having role models who are leaders who are prepared to show the less savoury sides of their characters, the warts and all type that Keris referred to this morning. Warts and all role models are authentic role models because none of us, no single one of us, knows all of the answers and is perfect. Now, I hinted at this earlier. Self-awareness as being the dis indispensable foundation to being a good leader. If you don't know yourself, I suggest you'll struggle to lead others because of that authenticity drive. I think I know now what makes me tick. It's a passionate team around me, sharing the same work ethic, wanting to win or become even better. I like working with different, quirky, creative people. But I also know what frustrates me. Low ambition, lack of pace within an organisation, or worse still, time-wasting and prevarication. So be aware of your strengths and listen to what others tell you in your 360s and less formal means, because chats are as invaluable in this regard as anything formal. And don't be too modest about acknowledging your strengths, at least to yourself. Now, I've been told by others that my own strengths are passion and intuition. And I remember when I applied for the job as chair of Sport Wales five years ago, it came at a time when, I think the best way of describing it is, it was inconvenient to my academic career. But I remember having a conversation with someone who's been a fantastic mentor to me over the years, Professor Terry Rees at Cardiff University. And Terry said to me, what does your gut say? And there was a very clear answer to that. I wanted to do it. It was something I felt passionate about and I knew I could contribute to. And sometimes, you know, following your intuition is the best business decision you can possibly, possibly make. You'll get it wrong at times, you know, but it's a better methodology than anything else more scientific that I've, that I've ever experienced. My passion for sport is what makes me tick. And many of you here share that, I know. Sport's the nation's heartbeat. And like most, most small nations, it propels little old Wales onto the world stage. It's in our DNA. But most importantly, sport is our nation's success story. The brave against the odds performance of the Wales team at the Rugby World Cup and of course our glorious celebrations when we ended the 57 year wait to qualify for a major championships and go to France next year. These were scenes of celebration beamed across the world and we have world beaters in Wales and in Welsh sport. We have global superstars like Gareth Bale, Jade Jones, George North, Geraint Thomas and they sell our small nation to the world far better than anything else I can think of. Some of you might remember my deliberately controversial claim at the BBC Patrick Hannan lecture at the Hay Festival earlier this year about the value to Wales's global profile from qualification for Euro 2016 and Wales winning the Rugby World Cup. Well, regrettably, it hasn't been fully tested, of course, but I do stand by my, report, my remarks. Remember, the European football market alone is worth an estimated 20 billion euros. Wales at the finals next year, not just Aaron Ramsey, Ash Ashley Williams and co, but our flag, our anthem, our identity will be beamed across the Americas, Asia and Africa. England versus Italy in the last Euros beat the viewing figures for Prince William's wedding and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee concert, you might wish to know. These are huge new markets in every sense and not just for business, for all of us because they're aligned with an opportunity to present a positive new image of Wales, away from choirs, mines, and dare I say, rugby. We all shared in our record haul of Olympic and Paralympic medals in 2012. 
We all celebrated when Wales topped the medal table, winning more medals per capita than any other nation in last year's Commonwealth Games. Yes, more than Australia, more than New Zealand, more than Canada, and yes, more than England. We came home with a record 36 medals from Glasgow, which beat even our stretch target, which was itself unashamedly ambitious. But less celebrated, but equally important for the confidence in our systems in sport, is that 18%, yes, nearly a fifth, of the elite programme for Britain's most successful sport, cycling, is Welsh. And that's with under 5% of the population. The same percentage in the UK's disabled athletics elite pathway. And don't forget that in that wonderful event that was London 2012, 12% of Team GB's Paralympic medals were won by athletes from a Welsh town near you, all with under 5% of the population. Success doesn't happen by happen chance, luck or accident. It's designed and constructed in a way that lasts so that we expect to win as a sector. Our goal is systematic, sustainable success, built to last so never again do we have this once in a generation sporting success that we've seen alluded to. We want Wales to qualify for the next Football World Cup, not wait another 58 years. We want an even better performance in the next Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast in Australia and in the Rugby World Cup in Japan. Now, let me move on to something slightly different. When I took over as Chair of Sport Wales, I faced a quite simple decision about the competence and profile of our board. And it wasn't about diversity, actually. It wasn't about more women on the board or trying to get a different reflection of the population. It was about ability, but diversity was the solution. Put simply, getting a stronger board to do and manage our business involved diversifying it. Because in my opinion, a board with few women on it, with no different ethnicities, with no disabled people, with one age group, with no se different sectoral experience, is unlikely to be a strong board. It will make decisions that reflect and possibly protect its own identity ahead of those of others. And these are unlikely to be in the interests or the best interests of all of our communities. And therein lies the nub of it. Nub of it. If we look for conventionally the best candidates for our leadership positions, not just on boards, we will continue to offer them to the tried and tested, those with traditional senior leadership notches on their CVs. The value of such individuals is undoubted, but personally, as a leader, I don't want a board full of them. I want difference. I want fresh thinking born from plural life experiences. And do you know at times from inexperience and naivety too? It's a rule, sorry, it's not a rule other than a thumb, but I like boards that always have two or three members for whom this is their first board appointment. Because believe me, their so-called daft questions are usually the most trenchant and perceptive and often the most difficult for the executive to actually deal with. But all of that, that process of change that I've illustrated there, comes at a price. As chair, it requires a different operating culture, more patience, more preparation, greater investment in induction and ongoing professional development, and a general acceptance that the old-style stuffiness of board meetings is a thing of the past. But it's a price well worth paying, in my opinion. So now, as you can see, we have a board that far better resembles the people that we serve. And I'm delighted that we're held up as an exemplar of how to shift the formal and at times hugely bureaucratic public appointment process in such a way as to include, not exclude, and that generated diversity amongst applicants, but more importantly, amongst the eventual appointments to our board. However, I have to say, I'm less pleased when opportunities for learning are missed to cascade out that process for senior appointments in our sector and beyond. We still have adverts and job descriptions that exclude as many as reach out to. And you know, progress in this area or any other is of no value if it's one step forward, two steps back. And by the way, process, deadlines and time constraints are never excuses for missing opportunities for change. Back to sustainable success. The diversity dividend, like sport, simply cannot be boom and bust. This slide exemplifies some of the reasons why we need a different set of leaders in every sense. And in my opinion, the business case for diversity is actually stronger than the equality one. 
Because if you appreciate the value of difference, pluralism, disruption, edginess, creativity, spark, quirkiness, call it what you will, if you're genuine about all of this, then you need to seek out people who are different, not just to us, but to our organisational groupthink. Back to athletes again. Psychologists talk about a link between hyper or extreme success in the sporting arena and oddities or unbalanced personalities. Well, you could say the same for some of us who work in sport, I'm sure. But, you know, this is about shining a light into those dark nooks and crannies and covering those potential blind spots in our business and challenging us all to think differently. The vibrancy and the discrete expertise and different life experiences mean that the overall is almost certainly going to be greater than the sum of the parts. And if we show a genuine long-term commitment to diversity, it could be the recipe for dissolving some of the things Keris referred to this morning, uniformity and challenging some of the undoubted unconscious bias that goes on in recruitment and appointment in Wales. And incidentally, diversity is also about knowing when to move on or to stand down. If you look at an athlete's natural lifespan, Gareth Bale that we saw there scoring against Cyprus has probably got another five or six years at the very top. Frankie Jones, the gym, rhythmic gymnast you saw on the screen, retired at 23 after her record-breaking performances and six medals in the Commonwealth Games last year. And as leaders, we need to put our money where our mouths are in every sense including knowing when to hand over the baton and when our true intrinsic value to an organisation is close to being expended. Now, finally, I'm sure you'll agree that all good leaders need fresh challenges and new stimulation. I suspect every one of us in this room is driven by a desire to test ourselves against the very best. And in true sporting fashion, my motivation as a leader is always a little bit competitive. I confessed earlier to hating losing. Well, I think that's a mindset that we have throughout our organisation. You want to see us when we're engaged in any kind of competition, whatever it is. But I've always been interested in benchmarking Wales, often but not exclusively against the other countries within the UK, but also beyond. Because, you know, we should care about how we perform against our nearest neighbours in Scotland, Ireland and England. Not, not in the way that a UK media, which is normally attuned to ignoring Wales, as the FM said this morning, has recently adopted. Not those coarse measurements of standards in Wales, which incidentally conveniently ignore the innovations and success stories. And not ones that feed on this heady cocktail of popular discontent and over-simplistic and politicised performance management. But we do need self-analysis and we do need criticism. We do also need to consider data differently, as we've heard over the two days. Is high satisfaction with certain public services a correlation with low expectation by some of our communities? I'm not saying in any of this that we don't need proper rigour in our self-analysis, but much of the media line that we're seeing when it judges our public services in Wales is what I would call analysis light. And what we certainly don't need is more self-flagellation about the state of Wales since devolution, as if somehow we're less capable of governing ourselves than anyone else in the world. Now, as you'll have gathered, I don't mind admitting that I take great pleasure in the fact that we outperform England in almost every single measure or KPI applied to sport. And that's not just because they're our rivals on the field of play, but more importantly, because it shows to me that what can be done with a disproportionately sized funding pot, a smaller population set against the harsh reality that in, that in elite sport, at least, Creating sporting champions costs the same wherever you live and however many people live in your country. Now, all that allows me to end with a positive. What motivates me as a leader is success, not just for myself personally or even my organisation, although both are important and we shouldn't be ashamed to say so, but for the people we serve. Because, you know, in testing our leadership against our counterparts in other sectors and other countries, we might just turn out to be pleasantly surprised. There are advantages to being small, not least of which is a tangible sense of progress where it is made, a real knowledge of each other, our needs and challenges and our communities, and the resultant scope for innovation and experimentation. As the FM alluded to, we also have the heritage and political commitment to community improvement in Wales, to create not just one public service, but an exemplary one at that. In sport, we are already the leaders in the UK, and long may that continue. But we need to bottle the resilience, the ambition, 
the determination, the self-improvement, the diversity, and the damned hard work of those athletes in Team Wales that you saw there, and cascade it across the whole of public service. And I believe we do have the leaders to do that, but we all need to be a little bit braver, a little bit tougher, and a little bit more diverse in our outlooks. And then we too can bring home the equivalent of those 36 medals that we won last year in Glasgow. Diolch o Laura, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a few minutes, so we can probably fit in a couple of questions. A hand goes straight up. Marvellous. Ruth, just wait for the mic to get to you. <coughs> Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ruth Marks from Wales Council for Voluntary Action, WCVA. Thank you very much indeed for a fantastic um, presentation this afternoon, Laura. Um, I wondered whether you'd have any comments as regards your... Um, line as regards people joining boards and the opportunity for somebody to make that first either application or to respond positively to whatever approach might somebody might receive in terms of taking part either in a public appointment but also as this week is trustees week mm. and there have been many um, activities across the third sector in, w in the UK to promote the voluntary sector and the opportunities for people to join boards of charities and voluntary organisations and so on. Whether you see that as a particular learning route and a particular way to affirm people's confidence in possibly then <coughs> making that next step to a public appointment or a other form of leadership um, position. Thank you. Uh, so yes, yes to all of that, Ruth. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot about that because the slide that I put up which showed the representational change in our board doesn't tell the whole story, obviously, because although we're now nearly 60% female, um, we've got such a fantastic calibre of board members, that male and female, that the whole culture of how we operate as a board has altered quite fundamentally. And the, f the freshness of some of the people for whom it's their first board appointment has been quite remarkable. Um, it does make things more difficult initially because you have a lot of... Um, preparation and coaching to do to allow people to be able to contribute in a way that you would wish but it's worth every single moment of it and I, I've got absolute as I hand over next year I've got absolutely no doubt that we've got a board that is really exemplary in every shape and form but yet if you looked at the names on paper most of you wouldn't know all of them and I think therein lies the point we didn't look for names in inverted commas we looked for people who were from very different backgrounds simple things such as something that means a lot to me I wanted somebody on the board who was um, a parent of young children because I wanted to really make sure we were understanding the way in which our decisions about school sport and PE reflected what a child's experience actually was I'm delighted that we have our young ambassadors sitting on our board now who contribute believe me in a way that is as strategic as anything I've heard from anybody in a senior position in in public life so, it, you know, all I can say is I remember my first board appointment. I remember how nervous I was. I remember how little I knew about the process of behaving in a board culture. But if we can all, as board members and as leaders, try and uh, recall that nervousness and create a culture that is really welcoming and open and diverse. And I think um, we've got a fabulous product to sell to people because there's nothing better than feeling like you're able to contribute to better in public services for members of your own community. Laura, thank you. If somebody can be quick, we can squeeze one more in. No. Okay. Laura, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Really great to hear from you.